Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Lauren Swartz and I am pleased to introduce myself as the new president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia. I'm delighted to moderate the first of many speaker events with you all. I look forward to a proactive, thoughtful and engaging conversation both tonight and in the future. Two key hallmarks of the council are to maintain a nonpartisan space for critical discussion and to provide lifelong education on foreign affairs to audiences ranging from middle school to the border and beyond. And we're pleased to have in the audience today members of the World Affairs Council here in Philadelphia and councils all over the US. Travelers who've grown with the globe with us on our many international travel programs and some of the high school and college students and teachers who participate in our education program. I want to thank all of you who used our pay what you wish option for this program. Like many other businesses and organizations across the world, this is a challenging time and we're honored to earn your continued support, enabling us to provide content like tonight's robust discussion on foreign affairs. If you have any technical issues, please use the question bar on the council and the council's vice president of programs, Kaylee Boyle, will help, help assist you behind the scenes. Later in the hour, I'm excited to take questions from your audience, from the audience, as I know my fellow panelists are. To ask a question of our speakers, please type it into the questions bar at any time during the program, and we'll take them after the moderated discussion portion ends. This afternoon, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Emma Ashford. She just concluded her time as a research fellow in defense and foreign policy at the Cato Institute. She recently became a senior fellow with a new American engagement initiative in the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security at the, Ale at the Atlantic Council. Her current projects include a book draft on the foreign policy of Petro State, an article on the politics of restraint, and papers on the future of the U.S. foreign policy and the liberal international order. Nicole Bivin Sadaka is a professor of practice of international affairs and serves as the co-concentration chair of international politics and security and the Masters of Science and Foreign Service program at Georgetown University. She's held numerous positions in the public and non-governmental sectors of the U.S. and Ecuador and served for 10 years in the U.S. Department of State. We're delighted to have you both with us, with us tonight. I've asked each of our panelists to provide opening remarks on the subject of the future of foreign policy before we turn to a discussion and then questions from the audience. Emma, can we start with you and then followed by Nicole before diving into our conversation? Great, thanks, Lauren. Um, well, I'm I'm really pleased to, to be here tonight, and um, thanks to you all for for taking the time out to talk about this. So, um, I thought I thought I would frame just my opening remarks in the context of kind of the two ways that this election could go. Um, you know, it's obviously looking a little more likely that it's going to go one way than the other at the moment, but I thought we could start by talking about a Biden administration and a Trump 2.0 administration. Um, so, just to dive right in. Um, a Biden administration is effectively promising a foreign policy of restorationism. Um, that is to say a return to American foreign policy the way it was before Trump. Um, and I would caveat that by saying it's restorationism within limits. So Biden is promising um, a return to the Obama era. He's not, return, he's not promising a return to the 1990s. Um, within that structure, the campaign seems to have priorities of uh, you know, rebuilding alliances, tackling climate change, health, global democracy. Again, a lot of the greatest hits um, from the Obama administration. Arms control will probably come up too. Um, but I think it's important to note that, you know, restorationism implies both good and bad, right? So it implies moving past some of the problems that have sort of bedeviled U.S. foreign policy over the last four years. Um, but it equally implies a return to sort of a, a normal foreign policy um, and the problems that come with that. Um, so uh, a liberal international order that's increasingly creaky, um, no real consensus among Western democracies about what to do about China, um, and just a lot of other problems, an ongoing war on terror. And, and the Biden campaign doesn't seem to have particularly good answers for these. Um, so I think that's in a nutshell sort of where, where a Biden administration sits um, if, if that were to happen in November. Um, on the other side of the scale, we have a potential uh, Trump administration 2.0. Um, and I think we can best sort of predict that, I mean, insofar as you can predict anything with, with Donald Trump, um, by looking at what the major elements of his foreign policy have actually been to date. Um, 
And we've seen, I think, maybe five sort of big themes running through the last four years. Um, a distrust of multilateralism, a distrust of treaties on arms control and, and basically all other forms of international cooperation. Um, we've seen trade become a core national security issue, but in some ways a fake national security issue. That is to say national security justifications used to justify strong anti-trade steps. Um, we've seen uh, a Middle Eastern policy that, that's almost pathological in its focus on Iran at the expense of, of most other regional problems. Um, and then we've seen a really strong focus in this administration on um, what you might say just personal is political um, and public relations is reality. It's all about how the president looks, how it benefits his personal interests and whether it plays well on television. And th that's sort of the core of the Trump foreign policy um, such as it is. And so in a second term, I think there's really a lot of, of sort of open questions about what that would look like. Certainly, I'm sure we'd see more of the same kind of chaos in foreign affairs that we've seen over the last four years. But I think there are a number of big issues. You know, does the US withdraw from Afghanistan or not? Um, do we maintain trips in Syria or not? Do we have better relations with China or does that go in a worse direction? And I think those are all places where um, nothing is really off the table. And this administration could go one way or the other, depending on what the president thinks is, is better for himself and what looks better to his base at, at that time. Um, in reality. Um, and I will say sort of one last point on this, which is I think a second Trump administration would be somewhat less constrained than the first Trump administration has been. Um, just from the point of view of we have seen just a declining uh, quality of foreign policy advisors um, to the extent that the people who now staff the White House are de dedicated to actually opposing Donald Trump's vision on foreign policy, not to trying to constrain him or keep him within the bounds of a normal foreign policy. Um, so that's, I think, two very different pictures of where foreign policy could go in the next four years. Um, the election is, is going to decide quite a lot on that front. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Emma. Nicole? Excellent. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me here. And Emma, thank you for those excellent remarks. Um, I will um, not to repeat much of what you said, because I largely agree with most of it. Um, I, what I'll do is just frame what I think are going to be some key baskets of issues which are going to define our foreign policy. And obviously, as Emma has outlined, it will be radically different under two administrations, the two different options that we have in November. Um, I think on the current events front, we have quite a few things which are going to define um, that's going to come to the United States that the United States has to deal with. And depending on which candidate wins, we will handle them radically differently. Um, China and Russia, obviously, I think are the predominant ones. They are unquestionably, we are in a global um, great power conflict. And, and this is increasingly defining um, both uh, our economic, as well as our security, as well as our domestic stability issues. And we have two countries which are seeking to actively undermine American uh, America's role in the world, as well as a lot of the values that we've seen underpin the international system. I think we've seen um, democracy around the world rolling back for many years. We're probably going to see um, experts say that this is the 15th year of democratic recession. And um, I think we've now seen the last four years go even um, more poorly in a number of countries. And I do think that's not just a trend which will be, oh, an interesting thing to watch out there, but I think it will fundamentally impact um, American foreign policy, but it will impact the United States' economic and security interests at home as well. Um, and obviously, the transnational issues that um, fill our feeds every day, whether it's um, health issues with the pandemic, um, environmental challenges with climate change continuing and demographic pressures, those will continue to be increasingly central to American foreign policy. And they're not issues which we can in any way avoid. And I actually think that they will in the next four years um, dominate uh, what our foreign policy looks like in a way that an agenda of either president will not be able to be advanced without significantly dealing with those issues. Second, and Emma mentioned this, is just the deterioration of the international system. The UN has been largely absent, um, or the UN Security Council at least, has been largely absent from one of the biggest world crises that we've seen now with the pandemic. Um, and we've seen um, 
many of the institutions that we'd hoped would be able to provide leadership or provide some sort of a role not do that. And yet the challenges we have are, inter are increasingly globalized, meaning we need international structures and responsible actors within those structures to play a role, not the only role. So it is that we both need these institutions and these institutions are not fully capable of doing what we're asking them to do. Um, and it's not an issue we'd love to be able to walk away and say, oh, it doesn't matter, but it matters so significantly that it's something that the United States will have to engage in. Last thing I wanna put on the table is something which, two issues which we don't always think about when we say what's foreign policy gonna look like. Um, first is what the United States looks, at home, looks like at home is gonna significantly impact what our foreign policy looks like and vice versa. Um, we no longer have the separation that we've had between domestic and foreign policy and um, the United States' ability pro to project itself as a leader and project its model as a, as a global example is being tarnished. And that doesn't mean that the issues that we're dealing with, whether it's pandemic or racial justice or other issues, are not in and of, some, in and of themselves important. It is to say how the United States responds to those significant crises that the United States is facing right now is going to be projected around the world. And so our competence as a leader at home will define um, how we're received as a leader abroad and how we project um, and, and follow democratic institutions at home will also be an example abroad. Last point I'll say is we have a foreign policy infrastructure that has largely been under attack for the last four years, whether that is in um, denying the importance of expertise or undermining our intelligence agencies or dissembling the leadership at the State Department. And we've just seen these institutions, many of which did need some reform or some effort to, to really strengthen them, they've really been under attack. And we, we cannot move forward as a country with a very complex foreign policy without a bureaucracy and institutions that are strong, robust, and full of experts to do that well. So with that, I will stop. Um, I agree with Emma's two pictures. One thing I would maybe differ a little tiny bit on, I do think um, President Bi uh, uh, a President Biden would love to sort of revert to an Obama administration 2.0. I do think the world has forced itself upon his foreign policy such that he couldn't do it because of the pandemic, because of racial injustice, um, and because the role of China particularly, but China and Russia now is not what it was four years ago. But I do think you will see many of the same themes come back in a second um, if, if, Pres if Vice President Biden is elected. Hmm. A lot to take in, but very uh, compelling points from both of you. I did want to, of course, talk about the election. I'm sure our audience members, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, we could talk about that the whole time, although I promise you we won't. I would like to <laughs> ask if, if either of you or both of you could point out one thing, one change that has been implemented in foreign policy under the Trump administration that you would really like to see continued. How has it given us strength and how would it give us more strength over the next four years under um, either a Biden or a Trump administration? Um, I don't usually lead with things which I like about the Trump foreign policy, but I will try and pull one, um, one. I, I mean, I do think that um, President Trump has stood up to China in certain ways, which I do think is important for the United States. It does not mean that I think in every way all the time we need to be aggressive towards China. I think we need to consider um, significantly how the United States counters China's influence in the world. But one thing which I would point out, I don't think this president has been good on democracy or human rights, and those are the areas that I'm most interested in, but I do think his willingness to put sanctions on China for their internment of a million people, um, a million Uyghurs who are um, people of the Muslim faith, um, ethnic Uyghurs who are Chinese citizens, the fact that they are interned and then those who are not interned are under tremendous surveillance and pressure in their um, in their province of Xinjiang, um, that is laudable. And so that would be something which I would hope that whoever uh, is elected in November continues. Emma? You know, the, the trend that I would like to see continue from the Trump administration is, is something that Donald Trump um, 
he, he's quite good at upsetting the apple cart of um, questioning long running assumptions about US foreign policy. You know, whether it's the idea that the US needs to stay involved in Afghanistan for decades more, whether it's the idea um, that uh, NATO allies should be contributing more to sort of collective defense. Um, I think Trump has been really quite good in pointing out these flaws that, that most people who study this stuff knew those flaws were there, but the US government has just never been very good about actually raising these problems and then considering what to do with them. Now, of course, there is the second part of it, which is that Donald Trump is not good at addressing these problems, right? His response in most of these areas has been really awful. But I would be very happy to see um, a different administration, whether it's in January or four years further down the line, continue um, sort of the, the, the Trump questioning of the world and moving forward with some of those concrete policies, I think particularly um, continuing with Afghan peace talks and continuing with the drawdown of troops uh, from that country, which the public largely favors experts in DC at this point largely favor, even if they disagree on how. Um, and I think without Trump sort of questioning that, we would never have got there in the first place. Yeah, I think a lot of his supporters appreciate that passion and are hungry for that. Building on the topic of China, could you, could you comment on what your recommended approach is for the US? Is it a binary approach? Do we have to be tough or soft? Is a more nuanced approach appropriate considering the long legacy we have with this country and the rising power we see from China? Nicole, we'll start with you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that it definitely has to be nuanced. I don't think that we can have a, a, a relationship which is completely um amicable in which we say there are no problems and we have no disagreements on anything nor do i believe it can be a relationship in which we are constantly hostile i do think that would ratchet up things needlessly um to a point of confrontation which i don't think is in the interest of the united states certainly it's not in the interest of either country um but i do think that we should not shy away from um uh two foundational things one the places where china is is blatantly um, violating international standards and international norms. And then also that we should actively push back on China's very slow, sometimes not even slow, but um, creeping influence in the world in which it is expanding its economic and political power into a lot of different corners of the world. Um, and not just bilaterally in countries, but also um, its effort to systematically engage in international organizations in a way that will start to tilt the norms and the practices of those international organizations towards China's interests and, and towards um, norms which don't conform to what we've seen in the international system over the last 70 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, your take on the best approach to China. Sure, yeah. Um, so I I think the biggest risk in the US-China relationship is that we slide into some kind of, you know, new Cold War. That's a terribly cliched phrase that's not actually particularly accurate, but that is sort of the thing that we need to try and avoid. Um, and obviously real conflict, but that's far less likely. Um, the problem is that the way our politics is set up right now, it almost mitigates us towards this kind of hostility. So we see in the Trump administration sort of ratchet up tensions on a lot of things, particularly trade. Um, in response, we've seen a Biden campaign that has tried to act tough on China. Um, and there's really very little incentive for either side to, to try and ratchet down this tension. Um, now, I do agree with Nicole that there are areas where we need to be pushing back against China. I think particularly internal human rights, what's happening in Hong Kong, you know, those, those are issues that we should be concerned about, that we should be pushing back upon. Um, um, but they share one commonality, which is almost none of them are things that require a military response or a militarized foreign policy. Um, and so, you know, what we need with regard to China is a far more flexible and far more diplomatic approach that draws on a lot of different tools of statecraft to try and work with China where we can. Um, push back against them where we where we can't necessarily work with them, um, but doesn't always have as its backstop this idea that we are in 
competition with China, that China is our adversary, um, and that we are somehow setting ourselves up for this, you know, big bipolar struggle between two countries. I think we need to start thinking about this far more as we're entering a period of contested multipolarity, where the US is going to remain a preeminent power, but there's a lot of countries that matter. China is one of them. And we need to think about how to make this world sort of more stable and safe for everybody. Agreed. And of course, since we're hopping around the world talking about our own country and then uh, China, let's move to Russia. As we know the relationship between the US and Russia is a fraught one and a long one. Between election interference, Belarus, Ukraine, Russia's own internal politics, this relationship remains top of mind for many Americans and of course US officials. What would your recommendations be to the next administration on the future of US-Russian relations? And should a US president really continue to try and engage heavily with Russia at this moment and continue to try, try again? Emma, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, so I, I can cheat because I think I wrote an article on this a little while ago and I can just say what I said then. Um, you're right. The problem with Russia really is that the engagement approach has been repeatedly tried and it has failed every time it, it, it has been tried. Um, the problem is the confrontational approach isn't really doing as much good either. So some attempt has to be made to engage Russia. Um, and I think, you know, the way that uh, particularly a Biden administration, because they're the ones most likely to take a new approach to this, the way that they should think about this is Russia is a spoiler. You know, it's a declining great power. It still has the capacity both to seriously hurt us if it wants to. It has thousands of nuclear weapons. We do need to keep that in mind. Um, but it also has the capacity to sort of inhibit America, what we do around the world, and even to inhibit our democratic processes here at home. So the challenge with Russia is setting red lines on the things that we really care about. Um, so we, you know, from my point of view, I would say we should care about um, election interference here at home. That should be a very bright red line for a new administration. Um, and Russia should know that they will suffer consequences if they, they cross that line. We should set a bright line around NATO um, and say that, you know, we, we do abide by NATO's Article 5, we will protect other members. Um, but then we should be clear about the other places. So for far too long with Russia, we've been very fuzzy in, in how we approach things, particularly in Europe, you know, talking about Ukraine and Georgia as if they're the same as NATO members, um, talking about Russian interference in Syria, um, and frankly, even acting in a military capacity in Syria to push back against Russian interference there. There are a lot of these areas where it's just not that important to the US. And so I think the most important thing for a new administration would be um, effectively being clear with Russia, what we care about, what we care less about, um, and trying to build on that foundation to get us back to a point of at least not being this hostile uh, with one another. Um, so I would agree with some of the things which Emma said, and um, and she articulated them very, very well. I do think Russia is a declining power, but a, but unquestionably continues to be a dangerous um, force in the world. I do think we need to push back aggressively on those areas where they are a direct threat to the United States. I think election interference and overall undermining of our democratic system and um, information security in the United States is first and foremost in that. Um, I also agree with the point on, on um, sticking strongly with our NATO allies, and it's something that this administration has not been as clear as they need to be on. I do think that the United States has an interest in pushing back on Russia's um, adventures in Ukraine, in Belarus, in, in many other countries in the region um, for a number of reasons. One, it is a direct violation of the sovereignty of those countries. And I think that the United States, um, along with a whole host of countries, we don't need to do it by ourselves, but I do think the United States has an interest in um, speaking up when there is a direct, um, a direct threat to the sovereignty of any country and a direct undermining of democratic institutions or those institutions that are seeking to, to function more democratically than they have in the past. I also think it sends a strong signal to, um, to other powers that uh, the United States will not step back to these regional areas of influence, right? Russia has engaged in sort of its near sphere. And I think that there are other countries that would be interested in doing that or are doing that in their respective regions. And to the extent the United States is silent, um, it sends a signal that the United States is fine with 
greater power, larger powers or, or stronger powers um, influencing smaller states in its near abroad. And I think that's a dangerous signal that the United States should not be sending. Thinking about partnering with countries around the world, large and small, and especially these two very large countries, let's talk about climate change. We must address it. It's one of the most complex and multilateral issues facing the world today, and current reports paint a pretty grim outlook at best. How can and should the U.S. work with other countries to, uh, to combat climate change? And on the flip side, or you could take it this way, how would you recommend that other countries try and work with the U.S. on climate change? Um, so I think it's unfortunate the United States stepped back from the Paris um, Agreement, and I think there were flaws in it, but I do think that it was um, a significant step forward um, for bringing the world together to say this is a problem, we have to do this jointly. Um, I don't think that every international agreement is worth going into simply because it is there. Um, I do think that there are times when the United States needs to lead and say we won't be part of something which we disagree with, but it is incumbent then on the United States to come up with a better plan <laughs> or to still hit the, the markers of an international agreement, the ones that are worth hitting um, without, um, even if it's not gonna be part of an international agreement. Um, I don't think the United States has done that. And I do think the United States needs to show the national government um, to working with local governments, because that's where we see the real leadership on this issue right now, and with corporations to come up with some sort of a, a standard and an agreement that we can set with other countries, or that we can set for ourselves, that is then a model for other countries. Um. I'm somewhat of a pessimist on this issue, I'm afraid to say. I, I find climate change to be sort of the classic collective action problem internationally. It's the countries that we most need to get on board with dialing down their emissions are the countries that just don't have an interest in doing so. And there isn't a lot that the US can offer them to induce them to do otherwise. Um, there is not a lot that we can do to try and induce China, for example, to, to stop polluting or to induce India to allow its population to not have cars. And I just, I, I find that the sort of diplomatic options for achieving sort of emissions reduction to be fairly small. Um, that said, I think there are some areas where the US could potentially have more impact. Um, so focusing on climate mitigation strategies, for example, that's an area where um, you could build a workable coalition to talk about how we, we mitigate the impacts of rising seas, how do we mitigate the impact of climate refugees, things like that. Um, the, the, those are achievable uh, goals in a way that I'm not sure sort of emissions reduction really is. Um, pushing countries to um, investigate new technology, uh, to use our extremely large research base here in the US, um, and even to embrace existing technology. You know, the US um, has a lot of scope when it comes to sort of pushing countries to use net natural gas instead of coal, which is somewhat cleaner, um, encouraging European countries not to give up nuclear power. That could be a big part of the puzzle. So I think there's a lot of little bits on climate change that the US, um, where, where we could make a real difference. Um, and, you know, this is, I think, where I sort of disagree with Nicole, you know, from myself, I think the focus on these extremely large accords like the, the Paris Climate Accords um, really sort of undermine our ability to work on those sort of more concrete issues. This, um, this mix and swing between these big, hairy, complex, international, multi multilateral issues and also requiring hyper-local action and action where there's a density of population, often in cities. There's a parallel between climate change and the pandemic and how we look at this. You know, is it a big national multilateral problem? Are the solutions also big and international and multilateral complex? Or are they really on the ground, people to people right in front of us? That's handled by local government. So jumping over to the pandemic from the topic of climate change, uh, can you comment on what you think the appropriate place is for pandemic preparedness in the US in foreign policy? Or should it be more left to, to the domestically oriented and even city institutions? Do you want me to jump in on that first? Sure. No, go ahead, Emma. You, I started the last one, so please. 
Sure. Well, I will not in any way pretend to be an expert in health or pandemic preparedness. Um, that said, it, it seems to me that the lesson that we can take from, from the last six months is that the, the role that the United States has typically played uh, in the international system as sort of a, a convener of countries on difficult issues and a provider of sort of goods and services where countries can't necessarily always meet those needs themselves. Um, that is a function that has effectively gone unfilled for the last six months because America has coped so dreadfully with this pandemic. Um, and so, you know, to the extent I think that we can um, lump those into foreign policy, it's, it's in that brain. It's what can the U.S. do to um, sort of bring countries together, help to facilitate the flow of information, um, help with aid where it's necessary. Those, again, those are sort of the concrete areas where we can do some good. Um, I think just talking generally about pandemic preparedness um, doesn't really do us a lot of good. Mm -hmm. I think the pandemic, and I, um, and I do think this question also of, um, of climate change are what we're going to be seeing increasingly, which is global problems where nation states can no longer deal with them by themselves. They have to deal in a globalized world and the solutions are localized, right? We're seeing some issues around urbanization. We're seeing some issues around demographic movements and we're seeing issues um, likewise pandemics, the cl climate change and a number of other transnational um, global scale problems that have local solutions. But I do think what this pandemic has shown is that the United States lacked both in global leadership and domestic infrastructure. And I'm not saying building entire new, um, new systems, but rather a, a functioning communication system in which the national government communicated clear priorities and also left space for a depoliticized process for local governments to effectively do what local governments do, which is deliver um, services and, and goods on a, on a local level. And I think that's where we have seen that the United States clearly did not um, both exercise the leadership and the opportunity that existed, but also have the right infrastructure in place domestically. I think the United States, as, as Emma said, um, had played in many ways um, a convening power of, around a number of global issues, but failed to do so. And I think in a time of crisis, you see either existing fun existing infrastructure serve itself well, or leaders rise to the top. We don't have we didn't have an international infrastructure that worked very very well, um, but we also had a failure then of leaders to step into that on a global scale to provide that to provide that leadership. But stay on this, this concept of big, complex international problems requiring really local solutions. And as Nicole, you pointed out, we think we'll see more and more of that. A third example of this, um, this pull or schism between the, the big, complex world problems and being on the street in front of you is immigration and migration around the world, right? It's, it's somebody else's problem. It's a challenge in another country that bringing people out of their homes and into other nations and to borders. But then once people are here from another place, in your streets, in your schools, in your community, it feels very local. Can you comment on what you think will happen with immigration and perhaps what's best for the U.S. going forward? Um, I am not in the uh, in the business of predicting, certainly on an issue like this. And I do think that the choices that we have for candidates in 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 November will bring us in a very different way. But I do think this is where we have to see the, the national government and the local governments have a better um, ability to deal with these issues. And I think the leadership has to come from, from, our, from the White House, but I don't think it has sufficiently. Um, and I think when you then look, for example, on an, an issue of migration and immigration, the foreign policy piece of that is to say, why is it that we have massive numbers of people who are coming? And the foreign policy piece of that is to then um, show leadership in helping those countries stabilize. And whether we're doing it singularly out of our interests or single or uh, out of neighborly um, engagement, people can debate what the impetus for that. But I do think a key part of our migration, our immigration policy has to be US leadership in engaging with other partners in the region, Mexico, the OAS, other organizations, um, uh, trans-American organizations to help stabilize the countries from which people are migrating. 
The second piece then is to work with um, the countries, the, the states which are most, um, uh, most impacted by um, these flows of immigration. And I do think that's where the national government has to be in conversation as two equal partners to have, to have those conversations of what this actually looks like. There are some roles that will remain the state. And then obviously there are other roles like securing borders and having a, a transparent process for bringing people into the country through a fair and an open process um, that still belongs with the national government. Mm -hmm. Emma? So I, I also I think I, I couldn't agree more with your second point, but I think in the first point, we also need to have a level of humility about what we can actually achieve uh, around the world in terms of particularly in terms of stabilizing countries. Um, so we saw a lot of this play out um, during the Syria debate, particularly in the late Obama. Uh, era where there were repeated calls for the Obama administration to intervene militarily in Syria in order to stem the flow of, of refugees. Um, and no large scale military intervention happened, but we had a bunch of smaller scale interventions, a bunch of other countries intervening. Um, the result was almost certainly not stabilization, um, but rather probably the production of more refugees. And I think if you look at the history of sort of humanitarian uh, military focused humanitarian intervention over the last few decades, that's a pattern that we see repeated and repeated. Um, we see uh, the US uh, intervention in 2011 in Libya, for example, producing substantially more refugee flows um, than if we had sort of done nothing. And obviously you can't prove a counterfactual, um, but it seems pretty likely that we actually made things worse in that situation. And there are other cases like that, particularly around the Arab Spring. And so um, I think, again, this is an area where mitigation um, may be a more effective strategy than trying to change the world. Um, so we probably can't fix failed states. The experiences of the last three decades, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, everywhere else has proven that the US, particularly the US military, cannot fix failing states. Um, but what we can do is try and mitigate the impacts of those state failures. We can help to provide resources for refugees. We can bring them here and give them a home here. We can help them to settle elsewhere in the world. We can strengthen the international institutions that help those refugees. We can provide aid. There are, there are lots of ways where we can try and mitigate the situation on a humanitarian level that don't necessarily involve sending in the US paratroopers. Yeah, if I could just follow up on that, I, I mean, I think I think the examples you gave are, are extraordinarily difficult examples, and I do think the question about U.S. military action is certainly one which we have to unpack. Um, I think the situation in Central America is so radically different than Syria, Iraq, and Libya, where you have armed combatants and and no functioning democratic systems whatsoever to to rely on. And I do think in Syria you had a, a government that used its entire military to go after um, both extremist as well as, as, as democratically oriented fighters and they're in a civil, in a civil conflict. And I, I think um, the parallel to Central America then would not, be, would not be apt. And so, and I also think the United States' engagement in Central America should not be a military one by any stretch of imagination. I think that our engagement needs to be with democratically elected governments, with civil society. There are, there are civil society groups and there are um, a lot of people who would very much like to stabilize their country. They have extraordinary problems with armed gangs and other um, violent groups in the country. And not to say that it's not a very complicated situation or that the United States could easily ma wave a magic wand, but I don't think that um, we can draw parallels to other situations in which a, the United States was engaging militarily, and B, the situation on the ground was 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 significantly different than what we're seeing right now. I do think I, I think actually this is a good point. Um, I think that you know the the Middle East question, where those countries are a very long way away and it doesn't really impact as much, maybe impact some of our European allies. Um, I think that is a very different question than the the Latin American question. Um, but again, I would sort of dispute the notion that there's been no U.S. military involvement here. At least some of these um, sort of disputes, conflicts in the region that are driving some of these refugee flows are related to. A 
America's war on drugs that's been going on for 30 years. Um, and we tend to think of that as being something that's fought here at home that's, you know, just a metaphor. But actually, in a lot of Latin America, it was, you know, the U.S. cooperating with democratic or semi-democratic governments, um, it, you know, fighting against gangs or insurgencies in places like Colombia. And a lot of those conflicts have continued to, to snowball and, until this day. So, um, again, I think we do have to question the extent to which um, we have contributed to this problem. Um, and, and again, we need to look for non-military solutions to some of these problems because the military one just clearly hasn't worked. Definitely agree that we need to look for non-military solutions. I think that's that's the best what, of what we should be thinking about and engaging in Central America. We have uh, quite a few questions coming in from our audience, so I'll take those and remind our audience if you'd like to chat in a question, use the chat function on our GoToWebinar format and we'll pick them up. The first question uh, talks about allies and regional cooperation. What about the European Union? It seems like the U.S. has largely ignored the EU when it comes to foreign policy and not just the current administration. How could the U.S. better engage the EU as allies in establishing, in, in establishing foreign policy in the world? And I'll start with you. Yeah, how, how long do you have? I have a lot of thoughts on this. Um, no, I, I think the basic problem is that the U.S. hasn't ignored European defense capacity so much as it has in some ways actively undermined it over the years. So a very strong focus on NATO um, and other institutions that keep sort of the US tied into European security um, while sort of trying to minimize or encouraging countries to, to minimize the defense pillar uh, of the European community and the European Union, um, you know, if NATO exists, so you really don't need that is sort of the argument and it's been the argument mm -hmm. in DC for a number of years. Um, the, the problem really is that that has actually served to undermine the defense capacities of the countries that should be helping contribute to a collective defense. Um, so I, I think, you know, for, for policymakers, particularly for, say, an, an incoming Biden administration, um, the, the question really is, do they want to continue with that state of affairs where they keep saying, well, you know, we're concerned about burden sharing and about European countries contributing more, um, but we're unwilling to consider the fact that they might go their own way on, on defense affairs. Um, and I think that's basically unsustainable as we move forward. So I think that's the big question the policymakers are really going to have to think about moving forward is just how do they rate the importance of that burden sharing um, that, that we, I at least think is really important um, versus the question of more autonomy on the part of, of European allies. Yeah, I would I would agree with that 100 percent. I do think that the United States needs to think about um, the, the burden sharing role and that the United States, I think the transatlantic relationship is an extraordinarily important one and that we have, particularly in the last four years, but I think it's been um, somewhat longer to that we've neglected it and we have or taken it for granted or at times undermined it. Um, I do think we need to think um, how we can how we rekindle that relationship and that we we continue to invest in it um and i think part of it is as we're also looking around the world and we're looking at um the recession that we see among democratic nations i think that we need to think of europe as a key partner in um in whether that's in providing aid around the world or providing an example around the world and the EU being um, a regional bloc that can show what regional cooperation based on democratic values, among other values, can look like. Mm -hmm. And when we think about the European Union, one area of collaboration that seems a, a natural place to start and a good set of allies is cybersecurity. We have a question from the audience. What about cybersecurity issues? Won't things like hacking and infrastructure threats become bigger problems with each passing year? How should the U.S. combat these issues? from places like Iran, Russia, China, et cetera. Nicole, we'll start with you. Absolutely. I think that's what that's the exact right starting point because I think that we see um, European countries certainly um, under attack, the United States as well, um, from countries that would seek to use um, a number of different non-kinetic ways to, to threaten American security and Americans' institutions. I think European countries are facing the same thing. And I do think that if we were to sort of join forces in a non-military way, but join um, policy forces together and, and come up with um, coordinated policies, as well as in coordinated engagement with, um, with our 
with our corporate sector, um, it would it would bolster our ability to push back on some of these malignant powers. Uh, so I'm not sure I'd say that cyber should be the most important US European issue. I feel like trade might be a, a good place to start, particularly after Trump administration. Um, but, uh, but on the question of, of cyber, um, I, I would kind of disagree with Nicole here. I, I think that there has been an increasing, um, it's become increasingly obvious in recent years um, that hacking is perhaps not what we once thought it was, right? Um, it's not that hackers sit down and type something into a computer and a power station explodes, right? This isn't die hard. Um, and no matter how many times, you know, you have policymakers sitting on stage at a think tank saying, oh, our cyber Pearl Harbor is coming, that's not really what happens. And that's not really what we should be worried about. Um, there's been some really great writing on this recently. Um, there was a piece in War on the Rocks a couple of weeks ago by Josh Rovner that I'd commend to you all. Um, but talking about the fact that, that cyber capabilities um, basically fall into either the category of disinformation operations, and, and those can be very effective, right? We've all seen across the last four years, you know, how effective those can be. Um, or they fall into the realm of, of intelligence gathering. Um, and in that case, they become a tool, a tool that others can use, and that we have to be aware of when other states use them, but also a tool that Americans can use as well. And in that case, it's, it's useful for us. And so um, I, I think it's important to be aware of these problems um and there are areas like sort of you know election resilience that policymakers should be should be thinking about but i am still far more concerned with um sort of the real world implications of say military buildup in the south china sea than i am with the, the idea that there is some sort of big cyber threat out there just waiting for us i think as we go into an election and we saw what happened in the 2016 election um, I do think that Iran and China certainly are unquestionably engaging in election, um, in, engage in the election for intelligence collection purposes. I do think that Russia is actively in our in our country as well as other countries, um, and many of them um, in in Central and and Eastern Europe, um, under actively actively undermining um, elections and sowing discord within a demo within our democracy, which. I would argue because it is so slow and creeping in our society, um, I don't want to compare it to blowing up infrastructure. And I don't think that that's a threat. I'm not worried about die hard fasting tomorrow, but I am concerned um, about um, the, the constant threat and, and efforts of the Russian government. And our intel agencies have said it repeatedly that they are actively seeking to undermine, and not just the election, that's just one part of our democratic system, but this sowing discord, sowing division, and sowing um, doubt in, in the democratic system is a very, very um, well-known and um, part of what Russia is trying to do. And I also think when our government, um, our current government is, um denying that that is a factor denying that that's an active russian um policy position i think it undermines our ability to combat it as well so thinking about combating disinformation and the the challenges and hollowing out of what you know our foreign affairs muscle over the past three years we have a question about a potential biden president how will the last four years affect the world's trust in the biden government and his foreign policy Things like the climate treaty and being partners and signing on to international organizations are three examples where we've we've stepped away from the table. Won't Biden find it difficult to reset our audience? I I am not as concerned about that. I think that um, I think the world has wondered whether what's happened over the last several years is. Um, a trajectory that the entire United States will be on for the next X number of years, or whether this is unique to um, this administration. I will say that this administration is not a complete bubble and nothing else happened before or after it. Um, it obviously built on what came before it. But I do think that um, the world has, has often asked where the United States is. And I think if um, Vice President Biden is elected and he comes in, I think he will 
walk into a position where people are welcoming the United States back to a place at the table, maybe not the exact same leadership place at the table, but certainly welcoming the United States back. I do think the types of things which he would speak about um, would be ones that people, that other countries would welcome um, to talk about international engagement, to talk about um, collaboration with other countries as a cornerstone of American foreign policy and at least one tool that we have in the toolbox. So I think that I think he would well be welcomed back. I am concerned if there is a second Trump administration that we will have eight years of dismantling of many of the relationships that we really need for our foreign policy to be successful for the American people and that that will have a much deeper impact over the long term than four years will have had. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think a lot of other countries would welcome a Biden administration with open arms. I think they'd probably pop champagne uh, on election night if that were to happen. Um, but what I think that doesn't sort of address is the deeper credibility problem that that has started further back than Trump, started in a George W. Bush administration and is now in Trump. Um, this idea that foreign policy in America is no longer bipartisan. The idea that um, every executive, every president comes into office, makes deals, and that those deals may no longer be honored by the following administration. Um, and so, as I say, we saw some of this in the George W. Bush administration, the withdrawal from the ABM treaty, for example. We've seen a lot more of it in the Trump administration. I think particularly the US withdrawal from the JCPOA and then just working against that so relentlessly. Um, I think that has been a real signal to a lot of countries, particularly to European allies, um, that, that US presidents may no longer be able to make credible commitments. They can't tie the hands of their successors. Um, and, and in part, this has to do with Congress just completely abdicating its role on foreign policy. If nothing can ever be a treaty anymore and everything is done by executive action, then any president could undo the, the actions of his predecessors. And I think, you know, so I think Nicole is absolutely right that a lot of countries would welcome a Biden administration with open arms. But I think when it comes to making concrete commitments, you know, treaties, arms control, stuff like that, there's always going to be that little nagging question in the back of the mind of a foreign leader. Um, you know, well, this is fine now, but what if in four years it's President Tom Cotton or President Josh Hawley? Will they just take everything back and it will be just sort of seesawing across Republican and Democratic administrations. And so I think that even if that doesn't happen, the worry that it's going to happen is going to be there for quite some time, thanks to how destabilizing the Trump administration has been. Mm -hmm. We've got just a few minutes left, so I'll take us to, uh, or offer the opportunity to take us to a positive note. There's a lot of challenging news, right? As individuals and foreign affairs experts and beyond. Uh, could each of you point to a bright spot in the world of foreign affairs that you anticipate over the next 18 months? I know it's difficult with elections just a few weeks away, but I'm curious where you see some real opportunity for us. Emma, we'll start with you. I think the uh, Biden campaign's commitment to improving diversity in its national security workforce I think that's a big bright spot. There are several organizations that have submitted dossiers of qualified women or qualified LGBTQ candidates um, to both campaigns um, to help staff up incoming administrations with the goal of trying to increase diversity, gender diversity, racial diversity, all these things. Um, and I think that that is something that um, as sort of awful as the Trump administration has been on some of these issues, um, it has, I think, made people more aware of what was a long running problem with the US foreign policy establishment and has driven, um, in this case, the Biden campaign, but hopefully going forward, both Republican and Democratic administrations um, to take the issue of diversity and national security more seriously. So that's that's what I'm sort of clinging on to as my bright spot from 2020. We'll take that. Excellent. Nicole. Excellent. Emma, I'm glad you went first because I was struggling, but you've given me ideas and at least bought me a little bit of time to get my thoughts together. I'll actually come up with two, shockingly. Um, one building on Emma's, I think, you know, the the pain that we see in the United States that is also mirrored around the world um, of how do we deal with injustice in our societies? How do we deal with long-term inequities? It's painful. It's extraordinarily painful. And people are going to the streets in a lot of countries. At the same time, there is a bright spot that we are dealing with issues which really needed to come to the fore. And 
what we need to focus on is not just the pain, but what opportunities exist to respond to it. And I am seeing conversations around the world happen, which have not happened for a long time. And so I'm somewhat hopeful that those will bear fruit. I also think, so that's the first point. The second point is I do think when things start to go down, it makes people question like, what are we all about? And we have to get in the game and pull it together. <laughs> and I do think those types of conversations are happening. We're facing pandemic, we're facing um, you know, people protesting around the world, we're, we're facing wildfires in our country and other climate issues around the world. And people are saying, okay, we've really got to think about this. We've taken a lot for granted for a very long time. We've got to think about what are the policies, who are the leaders, what are the relationships and the and the um, organizations that we need, and what are the values that have to underpin both our our policies at home and our foreign policy abroad. Um, and it's very easy in a country which is as wonderful as the United States to take that for granted until we recognize what's at stake what could be lost, how far we still have to go. And I think this year, as hard as it has been, and it's only October, <laughs> only October 5th, um, as hard as this year has been, I hope that it's shaking us out of complacency into a point where we're saying, we've got to get in the game and we've got we've to turn this around. Thank you both. On behalf of the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia, this was a fantastic discussion. We took a, some hard topics and some dark topics, but we also left with some ideas for the future, get engaged, face that challenge in the face and come up with new ideas for engagement and focus on having a more diverse approach and a more diverse voice from the United States to reapproach the world, whatever comes next. Thank you both very much. Thank you to our audience for sticking with us tonight and we hope to see you again virtually soon. Good night. Excellent. Thank you both. Great to be in conversation. Thank you.